Welcome to the Golf Fitness Bomb Squad. My name is Chris Finn. I'm your host, and I'm excited today to have one of my mentors, uh, and actually uh, probably the man responsible for P4S Golf uh, that blazed the pathway in the golf fitness space. Um, I'm just going to tell you guys, uh, buckle up, because it's going to be a, a pretty fun one today. We have the founder, uh, co-founder of, of TPI, Tyler's Performance Institute, a uh, good friend, Greg Rose, uh, with us today. Greg, thanks so much for making the time to, uh, to hang out with us today. Thanks for inviting me, Chris. Always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to start just because I always like to do this to everybody that we have on um, is for people who maybe have been living under a rock, don't know who you are. Like, talk about the one of the things that's near and dear to my heart that you, you've gone through as well. We talked about it when I was out uh, in California last time was just kind of how you got started, that entrepreneurial journey. I know you had a had kind of your, your own spot initially and then it's it's uh you know taking on uh, a, a version of steroids uh into the facility that you guys are building now out at oceanside but how'd you get started and, and what was it like i'll give you the i'll give you the short version so my background is uh, i'm a chiropractor with a, a an undergraduate in engineering um decide i love golf decided wanted to open up a practice in golf and then one day um the ceo of the title of the golf company Titleist, uh, was introduced to me by a golf professional by the name of Dave Phillips. And uh, the, the CEO said, you know, if you look at most professional sports around the world, NFL, NBA, you, you name it, um, MLB, the teams sponsor the players, and then they hire a performance team to take care of the players. And he's like, you know, we sponsor a lot of players, but we've never put together a team to help our players. Do you think we should do that? And Dave and I were like, uh, yeah, we think you should do that. And uh, he was like, well, if you guys would be willing to do that for us, we're willing to invest in that. In 2003, Tylos opened up. Well, we, we founded the Tylos Performance Institute in San Diego, and we've been taking care of, of all the Tylos players worldwide ever since. And uh, we also created a certification program um, for other medical, fitness, and golf coaches to go through to kind of pass down the information and knowledge we're learning from the best players so that we can make all golfers better. Oh, cool. Yeah, I remember the uh, first time I saw, so I think it was 2011 was when I got certified. Uh, and I walked in and it was you and Jason and uh, it, the whole team was up there. And uh, I went there, I think I went with my, my director of physical therapy at that point. I'd only been out probably a year. I was like, wow, that's so cool. I would love to like get smart enough to like do something in this field. And, uh, you know, fast forward 13, 14 years later, and it's uh, it's just been so cool. Um, for me just to see, I, I still remember back then, and I'm sure you had this too, uh, when I started in a, the, the shed I was in and, um, I joke with my team now cause they're like, Oh, it's hard to get people to buy in. I'm like, man, when I did it, they didn't even know what golf fitness was. They were like, <laughs> and not only did I have to like convince them I could help them, I had to like tell them what the heck golf fitness was. And you know, the fact I always joke with them, I say, well, you guys should hand write a letter to Greg and, and Dave and thank them telling the world what golf fitness was so you no longer have to have to educate them what was that like early on getting the buy-in from players and, and golfers to like you know, do everything that they just do now yeah, it's funny you say that because i was actually just having a conversation with one of our advisory board members randy myers and sea island which i'm sure you yeah. know randy, but um randy and i did one of the first seminars ever for golf i think it was 1998 we were at pga national where he was working and we advertised this whole golf fitness seminar. And I think 12 people showed up. It was me and Randy and 12 people. And I think we spent half our time trying to convince them that if you worked out, you weren't going to play worse, right? Yeah. So um, I, like you said, the world has changed a lot. I think that in the past, you know, golf was one of those sports where you drive a cart, you drink some beer, and you play some golf, right? You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And then the whole world changed, Chris, as you know, in 1996. And that's when... Yeah. Uh, young phenom by the name of tiger woods came out and everyone was like man this kid's different like what's he doing and tiger was very much into crossing all the boxes right and making sure especially his fitness and there was always there were some early adopters the gary players the nick mm -hmm. faldos greg normans but you know it, and brad faxon but um a, a lot of guys you know they just didn't see the value until they couldn't compete anymore with the when they met a real athlete playing golf you know so i always say it's like you know, you can make a player really, really good at golf and hitting the ball straight. But when you hit somebody who hits at 150 yards past you straight, you realize you have no chance in winning. And that's where everybody goes, I think I might have made a mistake. I, I might need to work on my body. 
Yeah. Now, now it's like the whole world's different. It's like, we don't have to convince you that exercise is important. We have to convince you that we know the right ones for you. Exactly. Yeah. Which it's a world I'd much rather live in. Um, <laughs> but so, so talk, you know, one of the other conversations that I, as we were talking when I was out there, I was like, man, I just want to, I want to like get this recorded because I want the world to hear how much information there is out there. But we, we were talking about uh, the massive rig that you have of like three different 3d systems out there. and I, I came back I, uh, and uh, I guess this, this is between me and you because we're recording it. So it's between me, you and everyone listening. But uh, I came back and uh, talked to my director of research and because we've been looking at different you know, markerless systems and stuff. And I said, hey, man, uh, yeah, I'm just going to call Greg next time we want to figure something out because he's got way more stuff and toys and everything than we do. And uh, it's just going to go quicker that way. <laughs> but I mean, so you've been doing you've been at the forefront of 3d kinematics of you know now we'll get into i want to get into you know kinetics and the force plate stuff and information that you've uh, gotten into but can you help you know just the average golfer listening here understand kind of where you started maybe like in the early 2000s with like video cameras to now like all the different technology between marker systems now there's the the buzzword of the last you know the pga show was all these markerless systems that are quote unquote amazing um, like where has the, has that technology, where to start and where has it gotten to and, and how should golfers think about that? Uh, and also there's also obviously certifieds listening to this as well. How, how should people be thinking about the technology yeah. when they're thinking about longevity and also just game improvement? Well, like you said, the, the world of technology has come a long way, right? Yeah. You know, there's like 3d systems out there now that are like $5,000 to buy one. And people are like, man, that's expensive. I'm like, Guys, my first one was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it basically <laughs> a VCR with a dry eraser. So it, it was like you know the world has changed a lot. But the, the, to understand like technology and how technology helps, I think there's a lot of people that are scared of technology, right? And they're like, mm-hmm. oh, it's ruining the game. Yep. It's kind of like saying, uh, oh, MRIs have ruined medicine. I mean, MRIs have not ruined medicine. It's made better doctors. But you also have to remember that the MRI is not for the patient. It's for the doctor, right? Right. Yep. What I want to say is that first and foremost is most of the technolo- technology out there is to make your team that's working, if you're the golfer, your golf coach, your fitness professional, your medical professional, smarter. So they give you the right information, right? And most of them have been trained to analyze this information. Now, I always say if you're a if you're working on a player before you open your mouth, you should want to know what they're doing. You should want to know how they're doing it. And you should want to know why they're doing it, Right. And I put technology in those three buckets, right? So if you want to know what a golfer is doing, the most basic would be visual, 3D, uh, 2D. Like just take a take your iPhones, best video camera on the planet right now, right? Just take your iPhone, slow motion, 240 frames. That kind of tells me what the swing looks like, what position your hands are in, what your body's doing. Now, if I want to take what a little more advanced and get some numbers, I can put on some type of what's called 3D motion system, like markers, sensors that you can put on the player, have them swing. And now we can quantify what they're doing, like how many degrees do they turn their hips? How many degrees they turn their shoulders? What's, you know, what's starting first timing wise? So 3D, I'd say would be an advanced what. Another thing that I think is important on what a player is doing is ball flight, right? So we can look at launch monitors. You know, every tour player now has a track man or a foresight, but you can get down to a $500 or even down to a $100 monitor now and get some great information on what the ball's doing. So I was- It was say- funny. It was funny. I was at the US Open at the range yesterday up in the radio booth, halfway down the range, looking back. And there was, you know, they have their names on, on each of their stations. There also was an orange track man on each of the stations. It was wild. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I think it's important, like the what is really important, but what's funny, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is I get players that'll send me what, and they'll go like, hey, here's my 3D, here's my launch monitor, what do you think I should do? And I'll say to them, I'll go, okay, well, now you just tell me what you're doing, but I don't know why or how you're doing it. So I, I, right. I need yeah. information to be able to give you, so that tells me what's happening, right? Now, if I want to know how you're doing it, now this this is kind of a weird thing, but it's like, if you show me like, hey, you're moving to the right. Here's what you're doing. You're swaying. You're moving to the right. What we didn't realize in the past, and really this has been uh, uh, really uh, in the last five years accelerated, right, our knowledge on this, is we now realize that there's probably 50 ways to move to the right. Like, how do you move to the right? Do you push too hard with your left? Do you just drag with your right? Do you push with your toe? Like, 
we can actually get really specific by, by looking, using a device called a force plate, right? So force plates sit on the ground, player stands on the force plate. When the players push into the ground, those ground reaction forces push back and it gives us a great understanding of how they move. I always say like, if you want to like step inside of a player's body and feel what they feel, that's the force plates. That's the how. And it's, it's, I would say that's a very new technology for a lot of people. It's been around for a long time. Just the, I think the understanding has accelerated so much in the last five years, um, but probably one of the most important tools. So once I know what you're doing, I get an idea of how you're doing it with a force plate. Then I'm going to get to the why, right? And this is where guys like you, you know, it's like invaluable now for the team. It's, the most obvious reason why you do something might be because it's the only thing you can physically do. So your physical assessment would be why. And of course, what you're thinking, right? Like if yep. you're like, why are you moving to the right? You, they might say, well, oh, I thought I was supposed to move to the right. You know, it might yeah. have. Yeah. So I think your, 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 your motor skills, your mental capacity, your physical skills, those are all why you do something. We, and for technology there, you know, there are, there are lots of devices to evaluate your body, right? So, Everything from you know your cardiovascular system to your power to your strength, your endurance, and and then there's basic like you just do basic movement screens to get an idea of what you're doing. So, um, so the technology out there now I think is is just makes our life so much easier in the business of knowing what, how, and why you're doing what you're doing, so that we can give you the appropriate information. Sure. So now, and I think you know most people understand you know, in a large part because, you know, you build and cheat them and, and all the 3D stuff like, hey, hips generally should go first, then the torso, then the arms and the hands. Are there instances where you see maybe a different sequence well, and me, you don't change that or yeah, dive into it. Expand on that for you. So uh, our, our evaluation process, I think, has changed a lot, too, over the last yep. uh, years. And I would say the first thing we do, and I'll just walk you through our process. So the first thing we do is we look at what you're doing. We take a video, we watch, we look at the launch monitor, see what we you use your, your experience to get an idea of what you think you're doing. I always say never get rid of experience and get rid of the, the old school, you know, coaching, but then we use data to verify or change right. our mind, right? Yeah. Well, the first thing we do is we look and we kind of make an assumption. Then we'll probably do a physical assessment on you just to see what works, what doesn't work, just so I don't tell you to do something that you can't do. And then the way we start our evaluation now is we look at something called the kinetic sequence. So we look at the force plate first, mm -hmm. right? Because basically all we've found that forces precede motion, right? So when you push into the ground, it creates your motions. So when you see the motions are off, we might be able to understand why just by looking at how you start from the ground. So we, we say that's kind of where the golf swing starts. So we look at your interaction with the ground in the normal kinetic sequence is there's a weight shift and the downswing. The first thing you'll see is a lateral movement. Then you'll see a little, what we call rocking, which is like a, we call frontal plane torque or rock, which shallows the club. Something that brings your, if you're a right-handed player, your right shoulder comes down, the club drops. Great players shallow early and steepen late. They don't steepen early, like over the top and yeah. try to shallow late. So normally we see a lateral force, then we see a rock, then we see them start to twist. This is the rotary sport. We start to rotate and then you'll see a jump, a vertical force, right? So the normal kinetic sequence is this lateral rock twist jump. That's uh, kind of the kinetic sequence. So one of the first things we do is we look to see, are you in sequence? Now, like you said, not every great player has the perfect sequence. They're kinetic mm -hmm. sequence. Some players might, let's say if the club's really far behind you, like a John Daly. Yep. Well, you know, if I, if I shallow it from there, I'd be so shallow, it'd be a problem. So a lot of times... Where the club is creates a necessity to modify your sequence, your kinetic sequence. So we might see them twist early to get the club out in front and then rock and then and then jump. So we, we look at kinetic sequence first. Now, if your kinetic sequence, your forces look great, but there's still a problem. Well, maybe you started from the ground properly, but you lost it in your body somewhere, right? So then we right. hook up the 3D system now and we look at what's called your kinematic sequence. Now, your kinematic sequence is what you do with those kinetics, those forces, and how you transfer it through your body. And like you said, what you should do, if once you create the forces probably from the ground, the lower body should start to rotate first. Then you should transfer to your trunk. Then the trunk should transfer to the arms and the arms to the club. That's like it goes from the handle of the whip to the second part of the whip to the third to the tip of the whip. That's the normal kinematic sequence, and that's basically the cracking of a whip. That's how you should do it. I would say that, you know, on the PGA Tour, does everybody have a normal kinematic sequence? No. Do the best ball strikers? Most of them. 
Like we're talking like 90%. But I would say there's probably 40%, maybe 35, 40% of PGA Tour players that actually have a kinematic sequence problem. But ball strike is not their strength. It might be their wedge game and their putting and they're right. just yeah. enough. Now, I always say that kinematic sequence, what's really important is you can be number one in the world with a bad kinematic sequence. A kinematic sequence is the most efficient way to generate power. It's not the only way, right? So when I say efficient, it just means when you, I, and I'm, Chris, I'm sure you've experienced this, where you hit a ball and it goes like 300 yards and you're like, I don't even feel like I swung, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Efficient, right? Now, there are times where you can hit it 300 yards, but it requires a lot of effort to do it. So yep. the people that aren't efficient, they usually require a lot of effort to repeat it. And some days they're on, some days they're off. People who are efficient, it's just, it just, it looks like Ernie L's. It just looks so easy. They, they, you know, it just looks easy in their swing. So, and I'm glad you started the down at the kinetic side of things because I think that's something that gets lost in a lot of people, and a lot, a lot of people don't understand it, right? Because <laughs> so many people, like I would say, just as in you know 2011, 12, the average amateur had no idea what fitness is. Now, fast forward 10 years. We're learning all about forces. They have no idea what forces are. <laughs> they're they're now using videos and looking at kinematics, right? So, I mean, and what's important too is when you're looking at the video. Remember, you're looking at the result of the forces. So exactly. when you look at the force plate, what's really weird is people look at the force plate and they're looking at the swing to see what's happening. And I'm like, actually, the swing hasn't happened yet for the forces. <laughs> like, like it, so it's kind of confusing because it's kind of like, no, no, this has to happen and then that'll create the motion. Right. So can you explain that for everybody listening? Because I've I think that's probably one of my favorite conversations to see just how confused somebody is at the beginning. And then it's like a, it's almost like a game. How many points can you get by getting them unconfused at the end? But explain well, that to everyone. I mean, anytime we talk physics, Chris, you know, it's yeah. more confusing people. But I hundred percent. Isaac Newton came up with these laws a long time ago, right? And the third law in, in, in Newtonian physics mm-hmm. is there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we know that when you push into the ground, if you push down with hundred pounds, hundred pounds is going to push back. And we now know that when you push it on the ground, that 100 pounds that comes back, let's say you use that to create twisting and rotation and move the golf club. Now, his first law, though, was objects at rest stay at rest unless there's some type of external force applying to it, which an easy way to say that is forces precede motion. In other words, you can't move unless some type of force is applied to you. Well, this is the same thing with the golf swing. So what we know is that when a player pushes into the ground, there's this ground reaction force that comes back. They will use that force then to start to move their body. So when you see the club moving, it's a result of how you pushed on the ground just a couple milliseconds ago, right? So it's one of those things where I think one of the most important things that we have realized in the last couple of years is that on the best players in the world, the forces happen way earlier. In other words, if you're going to get those forces from the ground to the club, you need time to do that because it's the force do the motion. So we see players now where they're trying to push from the ground like close to impact. And we're going, there's not enough time to get it to the club. That's way too late. You're just hitting with your upper body. My, my favorite's the 55, 60 year old who maxes their peak forces after they've hit the golf ball. And I think a lot of people might think they're spot, like they might think we used to think, Chris, like, hey, I need to post up really hard at impact and stay mm-hmm. down. And I'm going, dude, that's way too late. Like, look at Scotty, yeah. he's not even on the ground at impact. Yeah. So, so let's dive into that because that, that is a, a topic, obviously, Scotty. Everyone talks about that right foot. You know, what for everyone listening, can you explain what the heck is actually going on there? And everyone, it's it's funny, you know, you listen to analysts like, how does he even stand? I have no idea why he does that. Yeah. Um, they, explain to people what's going on and how that's actually feasible. Well, I would say the, the most shocking thing is his left foot, right? So, like, I think. Yeah. I think most people, you know, used to think because it's kind of like Tiger Woods, you know, when when phenoms come out, we study those people, right? Yeah. And you saw Tiger with this nice, firm, planted left leg, knee extending, and you're like, man, look at that stable, uh, that stable lead side. And then all of a sudden, you know, we start looking at long drive tour and we're like, none of these guys have a stable front side. Like, it looks yeah, like exactly. Going, right. <laughs> we're like, man, it looks like they're going to break their ankle. And then you were going, you know what, maybe there's something, to, maybe the way they're creating power is causing this, right? And yeah. we didn't realize until we had the force plates is that they're almost doing a vertical jump. And they are, not almost, they are doing a vertical jump. Yeah. That vertical jump helps create, it's like it helps the, if you're a water skier, it makes the boat move in the opposite direction so the skier goes flying. And it does the same thing to the golf club. And if you do it right, and you do this jump at the right time, like I said, early enough to get it to the club, by the time you get to impact, your feet are off the ground. Like if you look at Scotty Shepard, like if you put like tees on his toes when he sets up, 
And then you look at when he's finished, he's not even near those tees anymore, right? Yeah. And it's kind of funny. We always say, you know, like with our long drive tour, people will come out after, like, let's say we have them out at, at TPI and the turf is just ripped up and they're it's like, destroyed. Hey, yeah. You let those guys take divots. I'm like, guys, they don't use irons. That's drivers. There's no divot. They're on tees. I go, that's their feet. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, ripping the ground apart. <laughs> and it's, yeah, I, I had the same exact conversation yesterday and the, you know, we were talking to one of the analysts. He's like, all they were talking about was the right foot, the right foot, the right foot. I'm like, guys, the cool thing is the left. Like, who, like the right foot is just, that's a product of something that happened way long ago. Like, like we should be thinking about the left leg. That's what the cool part is. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think that that was uh, old school observation of looking at good players without having the technology to really understand what's going on. And now that we do, I mean, people are like, man, I can't believe how, how far players hit the ball right now. Yeah. Well, let's talk about why that happens. Of course, there's been advances in technology, but you know what the biggest advancement is? Our knowledge of how to create power. Like we, like the way you train kids now, I'm sure 20 years ago, it's totally different, right? And now we, we got kids that are hitting 200 mile an hour ball speed and they're 15 years old because we understand how to create power now. I would break it up into the, like, I don't know, let's call it the last five years and the five years prior. There has been like a level up every five years in this the. 13, 14, 15 year olds that we have now compared to 13, 14, 15 year olds 10 years ago, I guess not even close. It's, it's, it's the same thing it's in medicine, by the way. It's like, you know, if you go back and look at the day the x ray came out, there was a huge advancement the next year. Yeah. The MRI came out, there's a huge advancement, you know, then you have all. So as technology gets better, it allows the people that are in the business to learn new things and apply those things. And uh, hopefully the players uh, benefit the most. For sure. I think one of the things I always um, have found kind of my favorite topics is to when you, you're hearing you talk about the engine that a golfer has physically. And, you know, I, we had an example. I always use this whenever somebody, you know, they get better physically, but they don't necessarily see club head speed jump. And we had a, a very good player, collegiate player, um, and we had a 60-year-old guy. They both had the same um mobility they both had the same strength numbers they both like we looked at their strength and their mobility uh and their power numbers actually they were all pretty much the same but then when you looked at their club head speeds they were literally 20 miles an hour different and it all came down to looking at when the the younger kid the better player produced his max forces like before p5 <laughs> like and the older guy literally peaked what? his vertical force after he hit the golf ball yeah, listen, you can have the biggest engine in your lower body, but if you use it too late, it's too late. You're not going to use it, right? right. So we always say, like, listen, we we can now, and you do this. I know you guys do it at your facility. We can take a player through this power testing. And based on enough data now, now we have millions of data points in the AI and machine learning, we can predict your ball speed within about two miles an hour, right, of what your engine should be able to produce. So when a player comes in, you know, before they used to say, you know, what's the number one thing you hear, Chris, every day? I want to hit the ball farther, right? Yep. So when a player comes in and says, I want to hit the ball farther, or before we're like, is this a club issue? Like maybe they're not fit properly. Is this a swing issue or is this a body? Like they're just, the engine's not big enough. Well, now we know how to evaluate the engine really quickly and be able to say, okay, you should be able to, let's say, swing 100 miles an hour, right? So when I say to them, I go, what, let's go look at the launch monitor now. What's your, what's your miles per hour? If their miles per hour is 90, right? Then you and I both know their engine's bigger than 90, right? And we're yep. going, you know, I don't know if you need a bigger engine right now. You need to know how to use the engine you've got, right? Yep. Or So it's either an equipment or, a, or a, a technique problem. So I think that's where, you know, we're going to go check the equipment right away and we're going to check the swing right away just to make sure you know how to use it. Um, now, vice versa, if you come in and say, I got to hit the ball farther and we look at your engine we say your engine's good for hundred miles an hour and your club head speed's hundred miles an hour. Now I'm going, wait, you want to swing faster? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if your engine's big enough to swing faster. Now, <laughs> I always say we could, but it's kind of like, you know, if you got a car that you know you shouldn't go over 60 miles an hour and you're getting to like 80 and you're like, I feel like the front tire is going to fall off. That's kind of yeah. what you're dealing with right now. Like you're going into a danger zone where I'm like, I'm not sure if I would insure this car right now, right? Right. So I, we kind of have that conversation where, yes, we could probably get more speed with technique. Yes, we could probably get some more speed with equipment, but think your engine's going to fall apart we need to get you bigger in the gym and that's an important yeah. conversation to have with players well i think yeah i think you know if distance is the number one thing that we hear you know 1a is longevity in the game and i think with the advent of 
the just the ability to create speed obviously there's been this big push in you know there's obviously lots of training products and like speed is for first and foremost in everybody's mind and the you know the big thing i always preach to golfers is like like let's figure out what your max safe speed is <laughs> and if you're already at that or it's amazing to me how many people are going up it's particularly single digit players in their 50s or 60s who are very good players younger and they're coming in swinging 105 and their engine is good for 95 and it's like, <laughs> Yep. Hey, I mean, it happens all the time because I always people want they just want to put speed. I, I hate to say it, but they want to put speed on top of crap, right? So yep. it's like mm-hmm. you said, like imagine if the axles are bent on your car and the tires are wobbling, and you say, I need to go make my frame more aerodynamic so I can go faster. We're like, actually, you need a more stable frame to be able to, like or, or axle to be able to rotate the tires. And it's you know, it's 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 the sex appeal of looking at the fun speed drills, right? Like I see the weighted clubs. I see the weighted balls. I do the different things and all those things can add speed. And they're very good at doing that. But if your foundation, your engine is not big enough, like you said, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, if, if the maximum somebody could, let's say, swing a club was uh, uh, 120 miles an hour, right? You know, when you hit a wall going 120 miles an hour, it's very different than when you hit a wall going 150 miles an hour, right? One's going to create more damage. So when you create more speed, you definitely have the potential to create more injury for sure and so let's i'd like to i'd love to loop back we've talked about the technology obviously the one of the big things coming out now is all this markerless stuff right the there's the ai is the buzzword now right there's all this ai 3d stuff ai like i always talk about cautioning people from pulling any exercise off of instagram or like like assess yourself don't guess figure out what exactly is right for you to me, I feel like the same is true in the technology space and all these game improvement, whether it's, you know, quote unquote, AI, and it's actually just a decision tree, but we won't go down that road. But <laughs> AI, uh, you know, whether it's forces or kinematics, like what are things that people should know, like the, to help them make the right decision? I, th- I think two two types of people. One are the, the golfer listening and two are the certified coach who's listening, because I think it's easy for both of those people to get confused and kind of tricked almost uh, in this case. I would say, first of all, it's a very exciting time in technology, right? Uh, The computers are so much faster now. We're uh, with some of the new cameras and the phones. We've got some really cool stuff. And especially a lot of this is coming from the gaming world, right? Uh, And we're always trying to figure out how we can use this. And nobody wants markerless more than me. I mean, it'd be so awesome just to be able to get data without doing anything. Yeah. I'm going to give you two two big cautions here. So uh, caution number one is the problem with averages. Let's just talk about that. Machine learning AI, what, what we do is you basically load the computer with enough swings and the computer starts to learn this is what a normal golf swing should look like. It's almost like, think of it like taking an average. It's not exactly yeah. like taking an average. And then they kind of compare you to that average to see where you are. Now, I always like to use Major League Baseball as an example, right? Yep. So I look at Major League Baseball and I say, okay, and this is a, this is a, well, um, I, I like to use vertical break and horizontal break, but sometimes that's confusing. Um, let's, let's just use velocity. Let's say, let's say this isn't true, but let's say the average Major League Baseball fast, um, Major League Baseball uh, four seam fastball is 94 miles an hour. Okay. Mm-hmm. But then if you go look at the data, you realize that most hitters are really good at 94 miles an hour. So if you look at Major League Baseball, they're either 98 or they're, uh, let's let's say they're 90, right? So they yeah. don't want to be 94 because the hitters like, so they want to be slower or faster, right? right? If I take all the Major League players and I add them up, I go a bunch of them are 98. I'm just making up numbers right now. Most of them are 98 and most of them are 90. The average is 94, right? Right. So the computer says you should be 94, but nobody in Major League Baseball is 94 because they're, they're about a <laughs> flow, right? right? So, you know, I, I always say that you've got to be careful with averages because, you know, uh, averages are great if you, if, like, okay, here's an example. If I took all PGA Tour players, put them together in a bucket and created an average, which uh, there's been some people have done this before and create little yeah. months. If Jim Furyk walked in, it would say you're the worst golfer in the world, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're outside the the norms, uh, it it creates a problem. But if you really study this, most people are outside the norms. That's nobody's usually average. So machine learning has a little problem with that. Is that we're going to assume that your golf swing is like a normal golf swing and give you some data, and it can create some errors um, because if you're outside the norm, it kind of freaks out, right? Because right. remember, a lot of this is algorithm based. It's 
they're taking some measurements and then they create an algorithm based on what they assume is going to happen. Now, as that those machines get smarter and get better, trust me, I, I'm all in on the AI. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's crazy where it's going. But there are certain things that I don't care how smart it gets, it's hard to measure. Now, if I'm looking at like how much your knee flexes, how much your elbow bends, I'm telling you, Chris, there are some great markerless systems out there right now. Right. Can, yep. And you can just see that clearly. The problem is rotation, right? Yeah. Rotation and even some bend stuff is very difficult. That's kind, of, that's kind of a big deal in golf, I think, right? Yeah. That's my whole point. Like, there are certain applications where I think this is so powerful. And then there are certain ones where we're like, man, I can only get so, so just be here's what I, here's my warning on, on markerless systems. Make sure you understand their air data, right? So, if yeah. they, okay, if I measure how much you move right and left, and they say, hey, we're accurate within, let's say, a millimeter, that's pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. We use those numbers. Use the ones that are pretty good. If they say our rotation, we're plus or minus 15 degrees. Okay, if they say that, which most of them are, um, that means they might say at impact, you're five degrees open, but you're really 10 degrees closed. I'm like, I actually could do better with my iPhone than that, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think that's because of some of the algorithm pose estimation problems that, that they have. Not saying that won't get better, but just know there are certain movements that are easy and certain movements that we just haven't been able to figure out yet. For sure. Yeah. Well, and I, I think the, yeah, I hope everyone listening, like take that to heart because I get, we get people all the time, clients that are like, oh, I got this new and it's, you got to like talk them off the ledge and, and then they tell you how much they just spent on it. And you're like, I, what's the return policy, man? Uh yeah. I'll tell you the, the one the one thing that I was really excited about last year is we have a a, a system called FIA. It's a ten yeah. mm -hmm. system. I'd say that's what a lot of the a lot of the markerless uh, facilities are using right now, and it's amazing, right? So it's take ten cameras, put on there, and like I said, it's really good. Again, it has the same problems with rotation. There's some rotation issues, and you're thinking, but this is still maybe I'll sacrifice some quality data for speed, right? It'd be faster. Right. And then you realize that when you take 10 cameras and you try and synchronize them, put in a computer, our computers are fast, but they're not that fast yet. And when right. now when you take a swing, like with some of these markerless systems, you say process, you know, right now it takes us about four and a half seconds to get the data so we can talk to the player. Right. Those are, we're talking two to three minutes per swing. So when someone takes 10 swings, it might take 30 minutes to process. And I'm like, man, I could have been done with the markers already. And it's exactly. Yeah. So I think, I think, like I said, as the computers get faster, those times are going to come down and then some of these things will be a little more practical for use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I agree with you 100%. I think it's a super exciting time. I think it's yeah. there's just caution for everyone, particularly coaches. I think that those are the ones that I talked to a lot about it. Just like, just be careful way, what you're feeding. Give, and if a company won't give you their error data, they don't want to give you their error data. Trust yeah. me, they have. Right? Yeah. So if they say, oh, we've <laughs> never done that. There's no way they have launched the product out in the business and they haven't tested it and see what their data is. <laughs> That's awesome. So the last thing I wanted to, to talk about with you, Greg, is and we had a, a player, particularly going back to the kinetics, because I, I know and through our talk, you said, hey, if I could pick one thing, you know, that's what I would take. Um, you know, in the pursuit of speed, we've I've seen, um, you know, there's almost some players that almost there's like a profile, right? Some players are better at horizontal or some are better maybe at toe heel, some are better vertical. So we had a player, engine's big enough to be in the 120s. He's, you know, going to, you know, local ACC university, very good player. He's trying to get up into his tech. Technically, he's actually only playing probably high teens. He's working with his coach and he decides, he hears in his mind, he hears rotate more. So he starts spinning like a fiend. <laughs> I get a I get a freaked out call after a tournament. I have I'm only swinging one thirteen on the course. Oh my god! We get him back in and we look and his horizontals have literally disappeared, right from where he was. And you you, know, you put him back in and magically he's up close to one twenty again. Can you explain kind of what you've seen in the sense? And this goes back to like the Jim Furyk or the outliers or that there's a there's a specific to me it's very similar. We talk about physically. You got to assess what you are, what works for you, and then build around that. Can you said, uh, just kind of talk a little bit maybe about what you've seen in terms of force well, profiles or what works for people? You made me think of two things there. So first first thing is, is make sure that the patient isn't reading the MRI. So that's that's really important, right? Because yes. make really bad assumptions or even over listening to the MRI report, because sometimes what they hear is different than what the person said. Yeah, so there was there was he heard he heard Japanese and we were talking uh, Russian. 
Right. So I always make sure that it, it comes down to like, I don't like handing my players their 3D reports, their force play reports. I just yeah. say, do this. No. Yeah. Do you have any questions? If they have any questions or if they have like, well, tell me why you're saying that we can talk about it. But if you trust me, just here's what you should just do. do right. Yeah. Now, now back to your question on, you know, like I said, there are four primary, let's say two forces, two torques that we see with the force yeah. play. You know, what if I have three and I don't have the fourth one? Right. Yeah. I always say to everybody, and this, again, this applies to everything, not just forces, right? Let's do even easier an example. Let's say I say, what's the best part of your game, worst part of your game? And you say, I, I say to my players, like, why are you on tour? And if they go, mm -hmm. I'm the best driver of the golf ball, you know, I'm like, what's your, that's your superpower. What's your kryptonite? And they're like, uh, uh, putting, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's got their, their superpower and their kryptonite. And if you look at your practice routine, right? And I always sit down, I go, okay, how much are you practicing your superpower? How much are you practicing your, your, your kryptonite? I would tell you, based on a lot of years of doing this, working with some of the best players in the world, if you say you practice your superpower anything less than 70%, you're making a mistake, right? Yeah. If you go, hey, I'm working on my kryptonite. I'm working on that force that I don't have 70% of the time. And then I'm working on my good stuff 30% of the time. What normally happens is you have, you, like, let's say your superpower is all the way up at the top. Your kryptonite, your worst part's out at the bottom. What happens is because you neglect your superpower, it starts coming down. Your kryptonite starts coming up, and now everything's average. And now you suck because you're just average because you don't have a superpower anymore. <laughs> so we're like, listen, if driving is your best strength, I want you to be number one in the world in driving, right? So we're going to spend 70% of our time working on your superpower. And then we'll spend that 30% that of the time starting to get rid of some of your kryptonite, some of your weakness. I apply that to the force as well. Like, so when I look at your force plate and I go, man, you're a lateral driver, right? Okay, rotation's a little down, right? I'm not going to go, let's go focus on rotation, right? We're going to go, let's let's really get the drills for lateral. Let's get that thing going. And then if we can start to add in some rotation, cool. If not, we still have a superpower, right? right. That's, that's how yeah. I attack. Now, I know like if I look at the long drive, long drive toward it's hard to leave something at they they're great all of them are really good so i want to add those but again i feel like i can't add that with by subtracting from one of the other superpowers right very yeah. Yeah, that's so a that's a so great way to think about it. so many players get on tour and their first thing when they get on tour is they go okay i got here now i've got to fix this weakness or i'm not going to stay here and i'm like yeah. no, 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 no no you don't you don't understand <laughs> we got to work on what got you here like this is <laughs> Yeah. I've seen that uh, one too many times, unfortunately, as well. Uh, yeah. Or they get there and then they switch all the clubs and uh, they switch everything. And it's like, no, please. If rid of this one problem, I would be here. And I'm like, uh, okay, you, if you can get rid of that problem and make your superpower superpower better, I'm in, right? Yeah. But if, if it's in the neglect your superpower, uh, I'm out. Yeah, 100%. Well, hey, Greg, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. This has been an absolute uh, pleasure for me. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Tyler's TBI, they are putting the, that new facility you guys have coming out. I mean, absolute heaven. Uh, I literally, for the you're away, but it's it's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, just for everyone listening, I was out there. Uh, I don't know, it was a month, two months ago. And we were walking on grass that I thought was turf. And then, and then you're like, no, that's actually grass. I forget who we were with. Someone said, no, that, that's actually grass. And I was like, no way. And I actually had to go down and touch it. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is actually grass. It is the purest surface. It is the awesomest facility. Uh, so when it does open, definitely for all of you guys listening, stay tuned with TPI. Follow them. You guys are everywhere. Just at TPI, I believe, right? TPI.com or at, at my TPI. You can see all that stuff. Yeah. Um, our, our, if you're ever out in the Oceanside, California area, I'd love to give you a tour. Um, come see it. We have our... We're, we have our Titleist annual, or our, I should say our TPI summit coming up here in October, where you'll hear the one and only Chris Finn speaking. Um, so that's October 25th through the 27th, where some of the greatest minds come together. But yeah, I'm, mytpi.com or at mytpi, you'll find everything. All right. Well, that's great. And, and just for you listening, we, you've been talking about outliers all day. And, my, and when Greg says greatest minds, I'm the low. Remember the 98 and 90 mile an hour? I'm the 90 to, to bring the average down. So uh, but no, got got someone's got to do it. I'm, 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 I'm okay being DFL. I'm fine with that. Uh, but no, but thanks so much, Greg. It's been an absolute honor to, to, to have you on with us. And, uh, and just for everyone listening, thank you, Greg, for everything you've done for me, for my career, for P4S, everybody that I hope you sometimes think about everyone, everyone, I think of everyone we have touched from our team. And I think that's pretty cool. Then I think, well, wow, Greg must feel really cool because he gets to think about that about me and my whole team. So, uh, so thank you, Greg, what you've done for the industry, for, 
You've changed a lot of lives of the professionals doing it. Uh, it's been an absolute honor having you on and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Thanks so much, Chris. Feelings mutual. Appreciate it. Come on anytime. Awesome. All right, guys. Hopefully uh, we diffused a few uh, few false beliefs, a few ticking time bombs you may have in your minds. Uh, definitely, you probably want to go back and listen to this episode two or three times with a notebook. Uh, a lot of great uh, information here. And uh, as always, thanks for hanging out with us on the Golf and Bomb Squad. and look forward to catching you on the next episode.